uh, uh, call to order. Good. So let's start with a uh, roll call. Uh, Commissioner uh, Gun Gunno? Here. Uh, Commissioner, Commissioner Martin? Here. Uh, Commissioner Shebium? Mm -hmm. uh, Commissioner uh, Battenberg? Here. Commissioner Benak is here. Uh, good. Uh, Joyce, would you like to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Do I get a motion for approval of the agenda? I second it. Ah, good. The agenda is approved. Uh, approval of the uh, minutes from last month. Uh, do I get a motion? Motion to approve the minutes as written. And the minutes from last September are approved. Rita, is there any public comment? Uh, we have no comments. So um, we're uh, going to be waiting, uh, I think, for, are we still waiting on the folks from uh, Influence the Choice? Yes, they're expected to come around seven o'clock. Okay. Yep. Uh, so I believe on the agenda, we're going to have um, commissioner and staff reports yeah. first, yeah. Do we have any commissioner reports? Excellent. Uh, sounds good. Do you know if they've got the video uh, available to? Uh, no. Yeah. no. Sounds interesting. Very nice. Yeah, we survived the summer. Yes. Uh, I mean, this is something I think that uh, at least I'm proud of that we had, you know, is to be able to fund the senior. Uh, mm -hmm. Great. Any other commission uh, commissioner reports? Um, I'd like to say uh, tomorrow uh, the Plateauians for Peace are having a bystander training at 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. at the uh, Beaver Lake uh, Hall. Um, it's basically is uh, it's tomorrow and next Thursday, so it's a two hour each day about how to deal with. Uh, you know, uh, situations where you witness something and how to safely uh, deal with uh, those type of situations in these complex political and social times. So um, it's, uh, I think, five to ten dollar recommended donation. Nobody turned uh, away. Uh, anybody else would like to 
attention. Uh, staff reports, Rita. Have to, um, quickly. So excuse me. Okay. Um, a quick reminder. Um, we have Anne McFarlane coming. Um, on November the 13th from 6 to 8, and it's going to be a virtual training. Um, and this is about the Great Citizen Advisory Meetings uh, training, uh, where folks will learn tips and tools on how to run effective meetings and follow best practices for fair and inclusive meeting discussions. Um, so we'd love for you guys to RSVP. I'll send out that um, email again to you guys tomorrow morning. So it's the top of your email box. Um, but yes, if you can kind of take a look and RSVP to that, that would be great. Um, so that's November, Monday, the November the 13th from 6 to 8 p.m. virtually. Um, also, Issaquah Food and Clothing Bank um, held, uh, is holding a Mayor's Day of Concern Food Drive on Saturday, October the 21st. And this will be held at the two QFCs in Sammamish. Um, and then that will be from 10 to 2. And so we'll be definitely heavily promoting that. Um, last week, I attended a new applicant information set session at Redmond City Hall. Um, this is for the upcoming 2025-2026 application uh, process. And this is really geared towards sort of small nonprofits or nonprofits that have not applied for funding. Um, I feel like it's very important that folks know what's needed in order to apply for city funding. So that's why we'll have Fun, we'll have workshops next year when the applications come out. But this is really just so that people know uh, what they need to do in order to um, have funding uh, from a city. Um, and I was able to connect with lots of different providers at that meeting. Um, had a monitoring visit to a Muslim Community Resource Center that went well. Um, also attended the Action Forum for Youth hosted by Influencer Choice um, that will, they'll be presenting today. Um, and then also, um, for the past six years, the city of Sammamish, along with the cities of Bellevue, Issachar, Kirkland and Redmond, have signed a Welcoming Week proclamation. And this year on September the 13th, the city, along with the Sammamish Farmers Market, the YMCA and KCLS hosted a Welcoming Farmers Market. Uh, we were able to promote the wide range of food trucks that we already have at the, the, the Farmers Market. Um, and then we also had performances. We had Bollywood, Zumba, Hula and Tai Chi instruction out on the green. The weather was beautiful. Uh, and we also had nonprofit booths from um, Central Cultural Mexicano, uh, Indian American Community Services, Kinon Health and Issaquah Cultural Circle. These are all nonprofits that we currently fund uh, just to really get the word out to residents about resources. And then Mike and I um, had a, a table where we asked um, folks to come and tell us where in the world they're from. And if you can look here, um, we had Tootsie Pops as well, um, but this was cool. We were able to like, people were able to come and, um, and stick, you know, where in the world they're from. Um, and we actually, were, the last 10 minutes, we were able to cover Australia. So uh, that was a great win there. Um, um, and, and that's it. Um, very quickly, um, Vice Chair Benak, um, do you want to talk about the Together Centre visit, I believe? Um, this is the, our last visit at yeah. the Together Centre. Um, I, I think that would be a great opportunity. We've got the time now is um, kind of just get people's thoughts and impressions of what, um, what they uh, thought of it. Chair? Yes. Is this working? Um, yeah, I, I think, like I said, this, it should be green. No, I'm not. <laughs> um, is it possible for us to work with the Together Center and get an invitation for our city council members to do a visit. I know all the sister cities have sent council members there and it's a great model and it's a good model that we could bring into and incorporate into Sammamish, especially with the development of the town center and things like that. 
So would it be us working with Together Center to get an invite for them, or what's the best way to? Because I'm in touch with the Together Center, so. Yeah, thanks for the question, uh, Commissioner Gunno. I think, let me talk with our city manager, Scott, about this. I know that the council schedule is very full going into the fall with budget discussions, um, and they have a lot of meetings coming up, but um, I don't see an issue with offering a tour of the Together Center. I know there have been a lot of groups that have toured it to date. Um, so yeah, let me follow up on that and get back to the commission. I'd like to add that I went to the open, well, the ribbon cutting open house um, a couple of Saturdays before, and it was absolutely a phenomenal, beautiful blue sky, full of food, thousand people, a lot of elected officials, uh, county, state, um, other communities, and it just was absolutely wonderful to wander through those three buildings um, to see what's upstairs there with all the affordable ones to pick up the papers for many of the, org the 22 organizations there. It's just very, very worthwhile. I love the Together Center in the old frame, but this one is absolutely phenomenal. How do we get one in town center? Well, I, Chair, I, I especially like the housing model that they worked with the developers on. And, you know, our goal here in Sammamish has two folds, one, workable housing and low income housing and their model actually fits both of those i had met with kim the executive director um, back when Kathy Huckabee from our council was the chair of the board of directors there. And this was all preceding having a capital campaign and doing anything about removing people from the, the, the present agencies there to somewhere for an in, a time that she didn't know it was gonna be how long with funds to be raised. And it was like, oh yeah, this is a real dream. And just to see what it has turned out to is absolutely fantastic. So we know that there's federal, state, government funds that can help with the, the construction and the funding for the, the apartment type complex and all. So it's not just contributions and grants from other entities. The, um, that uh, Saturday uh, planning, what's it called on Saturday? The uh, comprehensive. comprehensive plan meeting. That might be the place to bring it up. I mean, put it in the comprehensive plan or at least get them thinking about it. I think another one could be talking more with the town center developer, which we all do with Mount Sandwich with the senior, mm -hmm. um, because they already have land set aside for things that may be built sometime, you know, whether mm. it's the, the garage, uh, whether there's something that can be done for cross path, is there something that can be done for a community slash, senior slash entertainment slash presentation slash art center up there. I mean, there's a lot of things that the city mm -hmm. needs to, so that we don't run against that. There's nothing to do in some mm -hmm. And while they had, uh, the Together Center had the leg up by having the property. Yes. Um, they also had that expense of paying the organizations to move off site. If we don't have that existing thing now, that we don't have that cost uh, that of running the cost while something is being built. But it, it would be nice to get it into the comprehensive plan if that's <clears throat> what the city wants. That's from 2044. Is that what they're leaving us that far out? It goes quite a distance. I think it addresses a lot of the problems and concerns various factions in the city have had about, you know, it's like, okay, it's the low income, uh, for, you know, uh, affordable income, you know, for working uh, people. 
but it also, at least from what I've seen, it didn't look like it added a lot more traffic to the area. So it, and it also brings in a lot of the human services. Uh, and they've got that beautiful Bella Bottega parking lot right across the street there too. And there's buses right up there. And mm -hmm. yeah. phenomenal. So it sounds like this is something that maybe we can look at is, you know, how can you work with the, um, the developers to, you know, make sure that this is part of the overall town center plan that, you know, whatever their plans are, that it includes something like this and that they have, they are strongly encouraged to work with. That's, that's a reason why the city manager should be able to work with council and see if they can find a time to be able to visit just so they can see the model to take it in consideration. And I won't be able to attend the comprehensive plan uh, meeting, but if you guys can just kind of spread the word and may even get the planning commission to s take a look at it, you know, because I, I think it's a great model, but Would that's just me. I agree. If this may be something where we could have a joint uh, planning commission and uh, human services commission to kind of talk about this, you know, it's like how are, how is their planning handling a lot of the human service needs that we, uh, we're trying to address? It's been a few years since we met with them. Stan, was that like about five years ago when we had to sit down with the planning commission? And transportation was one of the big issues at that time, as well as the housing that could be affordable. So question for staff, is this kind of, are we, we're not overstepping our charter or appointment goal established by council? I think, um, I think it's a good idea to ask the question at the September, or excuse me, the Saturday meeting for the comprehensive plan, because you're gonna have the subject matter experts at the city who are a little more plugged in with that project and we'll probably be able to give you a little bit more detail on what it would take and kind of where the discussions are at with the developer at the moment. Uh, Rita and I aren't uh, too up to speed on that at the moment. So I would bring it up on Saturday just to say that, you know, the commission toured the center. It was um, seemed like a great model and what would it take to do something like that here? And just then we can understand kind of the feasibility of that and from there sort of determine if it's something that we, um, you know, elevate to council or otherwise. Council will be at the Saturday meeting. It's council and commissions, uh, as well as the um, staff that are working on this project. So uh, if if there's ever going to be an answer to whether this is feasible, it's probably going to be at that. Yeah, I think it's a discussion. good opportunity to open the door for a discussion at least and take it from there. Thank you. I know there's one other thing I wanted to bring up. I was going to talk about the um, human services needs um, uh, report. Is this a good time, uh, Rita? So um, the, at least the last time I looked at it, the, the human services needs report for Sammamish was definitely pre-COVID. It didn't seem to cover a lot of the issues we're uh, concerned with now, like a lot of the mental health uh, concerns, especially among uh, the kids uh, and substance abuse. So my thought was, is this something that perhaps we would want to start planning for for next year is uh, updating that to reflect our current uh, status there. We would obviously need some money from the council, but I would not be surprised if they were open to better understanding what are the needs of our citizens around human services. That was six years ago, 2017, when we were meeting with various focus groups and the, the Burke people mm -hmm. and going through the process of selecting the group, group. And it's like, you're right, it's a whole different world. So question for staff, is it in the budget to do another needs assessment? Uh, you read my mind, that's kind of where I was going. <laughs> we don't have uh, money in the 2024 budget at the moment to complete a needs assessment. Uh, if anyone was watching the council meeting last night, they're actually considering some reductions overall to the 2024 budget except for human services, public safety. Um, these won't impact services, but 
just to kind of understand what the council's thinking, we're looking at about 4% reduction to the 2024 budget in order to um, try and get the city back on the right track. Uh, there's a fiscal sustainability plan that's going on right now that's considering um, how best the city can get on a better financial track 10 years into the future. Uh, and so that's kind of one of the first steps we're taking are these expenditure reductions in 24 um, and then looking forward. So that's just to say that in 2024, we don't have any money set aside to you know, bring in a consultant and relook at the plan. Uh, those who were here at the time recall it was a consultant developed plan. It was Burke Consulting, who's done a lot of other work for the city. Um, I would say um, if we did want to include money for this, that would be probably a, our 25-26 biennial budget discussion. So council is going to be looking at um, the budget probably next summer. And that's when we probably make the ask for some money to do this, this work through a consultant. The other issue with trying to do this next year, apart from not having budget, is that it's going to be our grant review year. So that basically takes up all of the commission's time and then some is we're all aware. So I think if we wanted to do this, a good approach would be to try and get money in the 25 budget. And then that's typically a year that's a little bit lighter because we're not doing grant review anyways. Um, so I know that's a little bit further out than probably the commission would like, but just looking ahead, that's um, what I would see. So that's path forward. So question for staff, actually for Rita. Um, how are we doing on funding are the performance markers being met and that's a great question um so as you know so when i providers give quarterly uh, reports and according to the reports i will either given the you know the, the the money that's allocated or not um so i know that i've held back on a couple um, I'd have to like look and, and refresh my memory, but I, by the end of the year, I kind of have a good idea of, um, you know, because some some organizations, for instance, like um, um, Assistance League, they have all their most of their reporting in the third and fourth quarter. Um, so I think pretty much everyone's on track. I think there's a few there were a few stragglers that I've, I've withheld, but not a whole many, not a whole lot which I know doesn't really answer your question. I can't give you the specific. Yeah, so nothing, yeah. nothing significant like we've had in the past. Oh, okay. As in like money that we haven't allocated. Yes. Well, that's a great question. Um, I don't know the question off the top of my head. I can get back to you on that. I think at the end of the year, it tends to be a good, um, um, like kind of a good sort of leveling sort of date. Um, I will say that in some instances, um, we'll hold on to and then maybe give it in 2024. Um, but at the end of 2024, we can't give it because then that's it, we're done kind of thing. So there's some exceptions there. Um, I know- On the calendar year basis. Yeah, yeah. I know so it's too tight of a crunch to go out with the RFP to try to get a needs assessment done. As in, like you're thinking, the amount of like money that we haven't allocated. Oh, yeah, I don't. I, I, I again, I don't know the exact number, but I, it's not that much. I don't think. I can provide the the exact number at the next uh, commission well, meeting. It's, it's government, so it's not going to happen quick. <laughs> <laughs> if we're going to get a contract, it's um, going to take a while. All magic, right. That magic group that was working this past summer for financing. I don't remember what it was called. Um, what was it? Something like twenty-one billion dollars they were trying to find. Hmm. Yeah, and you know the past, what the past years kind of did. Hmm. Oh, the Union supported it. Hmm. Still, our the Union supported it. Hmm. 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 Not the churches, other uses for the facility. And they're looking for about 500 square feet of office space, uh, preferably in a, like a 400 square foot all purpose room for the staff and the three, uh, three part time staff and their supplies and the remaining 100 square foot 10 by 10 office for the director. And the budget is 
uh, $300 a month. So I don't know where in Sammamish or Issaquah they might be able to locate. But, uh, yeah. Hmm. And where? Even if it was available, you're not going to be able to. And most churches are already, you know, using their space for child care and other things. Mm -hmm. Unless there's a developer who wants to make a profit. Right. Or a person. Or like a pet smart that hasn't been used for mm -hmm. half of its three months of being there. Yeah. I think we want to welcome uh, the folks from uh, Influence for Choice. Like to introduce yourself. Uh, actually, we, maybe we should we introduce ourselves? I'm Joyce Spottenberg. I met you at the Samantha Rotary, and we talked about influence for choice. And uh, Rebecca serves on your board. And I watched the videos again today, and I am very, very impressed with your work. I've been on the commission. This is my ninth year. Hi, I'm Mary Martin, and this is also my first year on the commission, and I am not familiar with Influence the Choice, so I'm interested in hearing about what you do. Hi, I'm Rich Benack. I'm this is my third year, and I'm also interested more in knowing a little bit more about uh, what you do. Daniel Bell. You're in seventh year. Okay. <laughs> I'm supposed to introduce myself first. Okay. I'm Cassandra Sage, and I am the Director of Development and Community Engagement for Influence of Choice. I am a past school board director for the Lake Washington School District. So I uh, have a pretty deep understanding, having been in education the last 30 years, what um, kids are experiencing and how we can help them in these really trying times. And I'm Marty Moraldo, and I'm the Executive Director of Influence of Choice, and I also am a sitting school board member for the Issaquah School Board. So I have a distinct interest in the success of our students. Um, and that's much of what we do um, as a prevention specialist uh, organization. So um, we have a slideshow. Do you see it this way? So Influence of Choice is a grassroots uh, nonprofit. So we are community-based uh, and our focus is the prevention of substance use and misuse. Uh, amongst youth and to promote mental and physical and social wellness of our youth through uh, providing opportunities for them to learn and develop um, uh, habits that, um, how do they interact without the use of substances in their lives. So we were founded back in 19, excuse me, back in <laughs> 19, you can tell how old I am. Um, we were founded back in 2011. Uh, we received in 2013, we received a 10 year actually two five-year grants from uh, the um, CDC, so a drug-free coalition grant um, that ended on September 29th of this year. Uh, this is our executive committee. I don't know if you know Barb D. Michelle. Uh, she uh, is also a sitting city council member in the city of Issaquah, uh, and she is our board chair, but she's also the person who helped write the very first grant. So she's been involved with Influence of Choice since its founding back in 2011. Um, and so we appreciate her longevity of experience. Don Burnett is our secretary. He is also a retired pastor. And so he brings the faith-based community uh, perspective to our table. Trish Bloor is our treasurer. She is also a member of Kiwanis. And I think she serves on the Issaquah uh, uh, Human Services Commission. So she's your counterpart in the um, city of Issaquah. 
And then Ina Gangerty is a past chair. So she was actually chair for several years of the organization. And she serves as a family liaison for the school district. So she's able to bring that school district perspective. So what we do is kind of four, four key areas that we wanna focus in on. One is around public awareness. So uh, there's uh, much learning that we need to do and provide education for parents and communities and give them tools to um, help us in the prevention of substance misuse. Um, parents really are at the heart of our work uh, between students and parents. So we kind of bifurcate that work between students and parents and community. Um, because when parents tell students their thoughts on um, substance use, if they say, you know, we, we don't approve of that, students are much less likely to use just by knowing how their parents feel about it. Right, now, right off the top, Pam, yeah. it's 50% mm -hmm. or higher. They are 50% or higher, uh, less likely to use if the parents come out and state their expectation that students not use. And that just seems like the first basic, everybody should be doing that. Um, but many parents don't know where to start. Uh, we also work with students on youth leadership development. So the more that they're actually working in the community, um, being engaged in their either their school or their community, the less likely they are to use substances, the more they're focused outwardly um, on their community. And so they gain, so we have programs that allow students to gain critical knowledge um, and develop those leadership skills. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. We also have prevention activities because one of the things we want to do is engage with students and we provide opportunities for them to, uh, we'll do a skate park hangout so that there's activities where they can see that they can have fun without the use of, of substances. As well as the other piece of that is just providing prevention information to students. And uh, we do that through our Power of Me, Power of We um, program our video contest, which Joyce mentioned, and our, um, our, our Teens Encouraging Community Health uh, Youth Board. And the last piece is community building. Much of what we're doing here today, uh, we meet with, we have partnerships, we do trainings. Um, we are looking at other organizations that are focused on students and interacting with them. So we'll talk a little bit more about community as well. So our service area based on the grant that was given is the Issaquah School District, um, which you can see incorporates, it's 110 square miles. Um, it ha we have students all the way down in Renton, much of uh, a big portion of unincorporated King County, about half of Newcastle. We have a sliver of Bellevue. We have about 700 students, uh, middle and high school students that um, reside in Bellevue. Um, all of Issaquah and about half of Sammamish. So, and you probably are well aware that the other half is then the Lake Washington School District. So what substances do we target, especially our coalition? We're really focused on alcohol because that continues to be the highest um, consumed uh, substance by our youth. Uh, cannabis, which is growing, so that's our second highest. Uh, tobacco and nicotine is our third highest and then prescription drugs specifically the misuse of prescription drugs and then um, a growing concern around heroin and fentanyl and a lot of that is fentanyl poisonings where they're not intending to use fentanyl they're likely trying to use prescription drugs in a manner that's not prescribed to them and it's laced with fentanyl um, and back in 2019 we had two youth at Skyline within a seven week period that were both poisoned to death with fentanyl. Um, and we did have a, a big um, event that we participated with the school district and I think with the police department and the city. So collectively we put on a presentation for the community to talk about the risks. And our, uh, our former executive director was one of the key speakers at that event. So we focus our work around what are considered strategies of, for change. So there are seven different areas that you can impact. And by impacting these areas, you can actually change the behavior within a community. You can change community norms. So 
much of our focus um, has been around providing information and enhancing skills. I think those are our primary. So um, educational programs, workshops, we do a hidden in plain sight is one of the educational programs uh, that we do. And that was the event. Um, we provided that during the event at Skyline in 2019. We hosted one at Issaquah High School, but again, it's for the whole district to come to, but it was hosted at Issaquah High this past February where we had a resource fair and we can, um, we had um, two news broadcasts, King 5 and Q13 were there at that event as well. Uh, we do uh, enhancing skills, so some workshops, especially for our students, we have what's called resilience and thriving. And that's an opportunity for them to learn how to build some of their resilient skills. The more resilient they are to what's going on, especially their mental health, the less likely they would be using substances. Another is uh, the providing support for prevention activities. So I mentioned the skate park, having activities where students can come have fun and not have um, substances there. Then we look at enhancing access or reducing barriers. And our organization in the past has not done as much in this area, but we are looking forward and putting together a plan to do more work around um, really um, making sure that it's harder to access substances is really one of the things we wanna work on. If you'll go to the next page. I'm just gonna throw in there that at the Teen Resilience and Thriving at Skyline last year, it was the first of that school year that we had done and the kids were so engaged and the uh, facilitator, Danette Ehrlich, who actually lives here in Sammamish, had them walk in and rate their stress level and she had this rocket that she just threw. And the very top level was my stress is in the outer space. And there was one student that was at that point and then was able to follow up and get help. Assist. But just having that in the schools, being able to go in and actually work with students is one of the best things coming out of COVID because it's a soft close for students to work with. The other thing that we're looking at, other ways, strategies for changing behavior is around changing consequences. Um, one of the things that our organization is going to be looking at over the coming year is uh, social hosting ordinances. And I do believe Sammamish has one, but what we really wanna find out is how is it utilized? How often are um, people being cited for social hosting? Um, do they really, do parents really understand what your social hosting ordinance is? What is the consequences? Uh, we're also looking at consequences for students. So can we add um, possession, minors in possession, something similar to traffic court? So we're actually um, in the beginning process of looking at, can we change consequences for students um, that are engaged in um, unsafe behavior to help them make better choices? Changing physical design. You guys have a wonderful skate park here, right up where everyone can see it. Um, the city of Issaquah initially did not. Their, their skate park a long time ago, several years ago, was literally in a ravine, nice, out of sight, out of mind, right? Um, except for there would be needles everywhere. They'll, they'll level beer cans everywhere. So it was not a safe place for young people to actually go and, um, and skate. So Influence of Choice was at the heart of uh, working with the city to move that. And they now have the skate park that's right there on 900 out in the open. So Influence of Choice was cr uh, critical in that work. So changing physical design reduced the amount of uh, substances that students were using while engaging in the skate park. And then modifying, changing, developing policies. And we do have a youth legislative day that I'll talk a little bit more about as well, but really looking at changes in either procedures and policies in the school district, laws in the, in the community, or even uh, laws within the state. So I wanted to talk briefly about why are we doing this, this work? And this is lifetime use in accordance to the latest 2021 Healthy Youth Survey. And you can see what happens. Usage of alcohol, cannabis, and vaping is very low in eighth grade. Fewer students are engaging. In 10th grade, you see an increase. And then 
12th grade comes. So what we're noticing is a community norm is developing. And so it's not only lifetime use, you'll see this about 30 day use of each of those that by the time 12th grade comes, rates nearly double or actually more than double in most instances. So that really gives us some insight. So we review the Healthy Youth Survey when it comes out. Um, the, the students will be taking it this month um, throughout the state of Washington. So we'll get that data in March to be able to update. But you can see that there is a community norm in how much students are using alcohol, cannabis, and vaping. And so we expect, and these are 2021 numbers. Um, if we go back in time, uh, rates were much higher. In 2021, rates were significantly lower because we had increased parental, um, the pr protective factors, so such as parental engagement. Um, and then we decreased risk factors like access. Students weren't hanging out with their friends where they were getting their um, alcohol or um, tobacco. So when you increase those protective factors and you decrease um, the risk factors, you actually can impact the amount of substances that students use. And 30 day use on alcohol for 12th graders went from 37% to 18% in 2021. We suspect though that 2023, that students are more engaged with their friends and less engaged with their parents. So we do expect that we're gonna see substance use um, go up. Can I, do you, I mean, with the legalization of cannabis, I've talked to young people who said, hey, there's nothing wrong with it now, it's legal. So I would expect to see a spike a little bit more on cannabis use with young people as well. It has gone up over the past 10 years. Um, so it, cannabis has been legal for recreation for 10 years now in the state of Washington. Um, again, we did see a dip in um, 2021, uh, again, because they didn't have access. Most students don't actually purchase their tobacco and marijuana items um, through a retailer who's breaking the law because it is illegal until 21. Um, they get it from friends who are likely either they don't ask somebody to go in and purchase it from them. It'll be an older sibling uh, that is 21 or a friend that's 21 that's purchasing it and then giving it to a younger person. So we think that access in 12th grade, especially because they're more likely to know people who are 21, it also is an area where it increases. But students, as far as alcohol, and I know even with marijuana, um, it's, parent, it's usually their parents. Sometimes with permission, with alcohol, it's uh, a lot of kids are getting it with permission. Cannabis, not so much. I do recall a student at Liberty that had, um, uh, had gotten caught with cannabis in their backpack and uh, the parent came afterwards and said, well, where's my pot? So they wanted it back. So um, there is some, but it, it is uh, part of the conversation that students want to know, don't tell me don't do drugs. Tell me why I shouldn't do drugs. Why should I not do marijuana? It's safe, everyone does it. My parents did it when they were my age. And that's some of our conversation that we have with students. Is parents' use of uh, like alcohol and drugs and tobacco a big influence around the kids? So if you know if the parents are like, they use pot recreationally, does that increase the likelihood kids will do it? Um, do you know what the studies are? I don't know. If you, do you have a study I've that you've seen? I've seen studies that go both ways where kids are like, I really don't like how you are when you're using this. I'm not going to do it. And then kids, hey, they do it. It's okay for me to do it too. And maybe they won't let me have it, but hey, it's my body. Is there any kind of chart showing like historical trends? I, do I mean, have this is just one can, year. I can provide some for you. I, I, I didn't know how long I have. Yeah, if you want to. No, I was that. just so curious. Yes, yeah, yeah. so we do have some longitudinal data. Um, and since the coalition has been in place, so I know that in 12th grade, um, back in 2010, I think is the data that we have, um, 12th grade 30 day use was at 43%. So 43% of 12th graders said, I've used alcohol in the past 30 days. 
this past year, uh, this past healthy youth, it was 18%. So we have seen a distinct uh, decline. And even just before the pandemic in 2018, I think it was um, 32%. Cassandra will get me those numbers, right? Yes. Um, 37%. So uh, if you want to pass that around. Is this a statewide up here? This is it's the Issaquah School District. Oh. We noticed anything that looks out of place here and we have to accept and Amazon and don't look like anything out of the ordinary. Like yep. Washington are a little bit more I went Englewood Junior High had one of those hidden things, right? Yeah. Because I went to the elementary school. And I think I had a couple other slides around uh, perceived risk, students' perception of risk, and then parents' perception of risk are the next two slides, if we want. Um, perception of parent disapproval. So, because um, I, do, I do have the, the risk one. So one of the things that we're focusing on this year is really about conversations. And in fact, I'll have Cassandra pass mm -hmm. these around. We're trying to teach parents how to have a conversation because we can see again in that 12th grade, disapproval, especially around alcohol, whether or not students think their parents would disapprove of their use <coughs> drops dramatically. So, and especially when you look at the inverse, so 75% or 25% of students, 12th graders, 26% of 12th graders think their parents wouldn't disapprove of alcohol use. So then we shouldn't be surprised by an 18% um, use rate, right? So the, so the lower that perception of parent disapproval, the more likely they are to use. And so what we are hoping is that more parents will be engaged in conversations with sharing with their student how they feel so that they can have a similar mindset of disapproval around tobacco. So we've done a great job as a, I think even as a country about saying tobacco is not good for you. There is a, we disapprove of our young people smoking, vaping. Um, and so as they, but as they get older, especially with alcohol, we seem to be more permissive. The perception is that we're more per permissive. And so we're trying to work with parents about how do you really engage with your student to let them know. So some of our public awareness campaigns, I wanted to talk a little bit more in depth. So we've talked about hidden in plain sight. Uh, we have what's called the Action Forum for Youth, which we just had in September, where we share community data. So we have, I can send you the Action Forum for Youth presentation. It has a lot more slides with data on it. It also contains data regarding our um, a community uh, survey that we did this past summer. And so it just is a way for us to engage with the community, let them know what's actually happening, what those results are. Next year, our action forum for youth in sep next September, will have all the data from the most recent healthy youth survey. So it will actually be really good uh, for us to be able to see that longitudinal data through COVID and now post COVID. Uh, we also do teen talks. So we have a teen group called Teens Encouraging Community Health, and they will um, also put together teens talking to teens or teens talking to parents. And usually we'll do, we host about one of those each year. Accesses to resources are on our website. So we have a, a pretty solid list of different resources that are made available to the public. We're doing positive community norms messaging. So, um, 
in the city of Issaquah, they happen to have a large, uh, uh, an area over Front Street where they allow banners to be put up by CBOs. And so we uh, took one of those and had our banner up there stating 88% of ISD students don't drink regularly, choose not to drink. So um, we, we still have those banners if there is any place for us to put them up in Sammamish because um, half of Sammamish is in the Issaquah School District. So that would apply to them as well. And um, the science behind that positive community norms campaign is that people just don't know what the real roads are. So our kids are going, everybody's doing that. I wanna go to this party, I wanna go drink. And not even 50% of the kids are doing it. It's, you know, the problem is when the 18% that are doing it have problems and they have stopped or they're in something else. But just creating that norm, the parents can go, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> not, not many kids aren't actually drinking here. Yeah. So, um, so it's a way of changing behaviors because people want to be part of the norm. And if parents do think, oh, everybody's doing it, so I need to be the cool parent that also hosts a party, we can tell them, no, actually, most kids don't drink and, um, and are getting that message. So we use some positive, um, positive messaging. And then we do have a social media presence. Um, and we also have links to the Talk They Listen campaign, which is through uh, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health um, uh, so, uh, Services um, Agency. <laughs> long acronym. Um, but it's really, a, again, trying to engage parents. How do you have that conversation? How do you start? How do you know what to say? Um, and how do you basically end that conversation? And you'll see in the flyer, those are kind of the three pieces that we talk about. So the youth leadership, again, our biggest thing, I think, for Cassandra and I is our Teens Encouraging Community Health. So we call it TEC. And it is a youth-led coalition. So they meet, uh, we have a staff member that leads them um, in meetings. Um, they, again, do team talks. I'm going to have them working on a similar uh, threefold, trifold around why students shouldn't drink, why should students shouldn't use cannabis, why students shouldn't use tobacco. Um, so that it's teen to teen because teens want to know what do their peers think. And so we can use our tech team and we're looking to be put, uh, putting in uh, clubs at each of the schools because we found transportation is really hard when you want kids to come together in a school district of 110 square miles, that makes it challenging. So we want to be able to put clubs at each of the, um, I think this year we'll start at high school and then move into the middle schools next year which there is one high school and two middle schools in Sammamish um, within the Issaquah School District. The Power of Me, Power of We is a uh, conference that we have with um, nationally renowned uh, Nigel Rangham is coming. Uh, it's actually being hosted at Pacific, Pacific Cascade uh, Middle School on the 4th of November. So it's coming up here. It's for middle school students because we do want to start younger, you can see the rates of usage for them is very, very low. And so we're trying to capture them beforehand. So although it's a youth leadership program conference, it's, it's actually embedding in it substance uh, prevention messaging. So it's very specific to that. And then we have our youth legislative day and we actually drive them down to meet with their um, uh, representatives and talk about how substance use is impacting them, um, how they experience substance use amongst their peers and ways that policy could, um, could impact that in a positive way or in a negative way. So if a bill is coming out to take away all um, consequences for having tobacco for youth, how is that going to impact um, usage around, around the state? able to speak in person with five representatives in one senator last year who actually sat down in their office and really, you know, they love to hear from kids anyway. It's, it's way better for that message to be coming from kids on how it's impacting them and the vaping in the bathroom and the problems that they're having and seeing than it is for us to say. Yeah, so they do all the talking, which is great. 
and prevention activities we talked about, so substance-free events. Um, our techs uh, students were, are working on a podcast so that they can introduce, again, teen to teen uh, work, resilience and thriving, which we talked about, which is a, a recent addition to uh, what we're able to provide through a grant through uh, the Northwest High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area um, Association. We're able to provide that resilience and thriving in each high school twice this year. Um, let me, is it end up in middle school? Yeah, that's what I thought. And one, one opportunity at each middle school and two opportunities at the high school. And then our video contest is, um, we've been doing that for 11, 12 years, 12 years now, um, where students are able to create a, basically a two minute PSA. And I know in the past, the cities have run that on their city uh, television stations. So I don't know if we've continued to do that. COVID kind of took a lot of things um, and upended what was normally done. But we'd still like to be able to put those out there, especially our winning uh, categories. We've also heard from uh, video uh, teachers, the, the video uh, class teachers, that, that it's such a great way to actually, uh, as a culminating project for all that they're learning about video production. Uh, but we do require that they have, we have prompts for them and they have to get data as part of their, um, as part of their video. And so many of them come away going, there's so much I learned. I had no idea. So it's really a great way for those youth are learning. And then again, their, their product is then being shown in the schools within the city so that other students can be learning from that. And the Skyline student won third place in one of the categories last year. I went and looked it up specifically. Thank you. Um, and then legis legislative advocacy, again, we talked a little bit about, um, we keep abreast of what's going on so that we can work with students saying, here's some things coming up and what are your thoughts about that? So it requires us to take time to really dive into the legislation as well. And I would say having that they could come to us and ask us to come for their presentations when they're, you know, mm -hmm. they're going to have a question too. Is, is, it's pretty fulfilling for us because we realize, okay, you are listening, you're paying attention, we're starting to see what's going on. Yes, and um, Representative uh, Schreier has actually held two town halls regarding fentanyl and has invited us to participate with that um, with her um, both times. So really being able, so we do do a little bit of that advocacy at the federal level as well um, because there are things that, Right now, um, cannabis is not technically legal on a federal level. Um, also about what to do about um, moving fentanyl to a, a schedule one uh, drug. So when, you're, when your Congress member comes to you, you know you've made an impact and they're interested in, in what it is we, our, our perspective. So we're a good resource for them. And that's part of building community. So we have, the way our board works and the way a, a drug-free coalition works is that we have what are called sector representatives. And so we have faith-based, business, um, health. Um, Officer Elias is actually on our board of directors as well, so bringing the perspective of law enforcement, um, media, so that we get a wide variety of perspectives. So we, um, our members, uh, are able to engage with us and tell us what's happening within their sector related to uh, substance use. They can bring us data, they can bring us ideas and concerns from within their sector. And the next part of their job is then to push out that data to those within their sphere. So it's a two-way communication. We can find out what's happening in their sector and partners that we can develop relationships with. And they can be saying, here's the focus of influence of choice um, either activities that we're doing, programs that we're doing, or data that we've received that then would be interesting for, for within their sector. Uh, we also have uh, community-based organizations that we work with. Friends of Youth actually has a member of their organization is on our board. Uh, we are doing an event uh, on Saturday with the Issaquah Schools Foundation. Uh, we just did one with the Bellevue Schools Foundation. We participated in a panel 
after a screening of a movie called Screenagers Under the Influence. So it was an outreach that they had and we were able to participate with them. So it just helps us to find where do we, where are our partners that we can work together with the food bank? Can we put this flyer in the backpacks or make it available? Who has access to people that we need to reach out to? So that cross sharing of information, uh, promoting each other's activities and just building good relationships with um, those other CBOs in the, in the area. And also in-kind donations that we might get. So Issaquah Highlands provides a meeting room for our board to meet, meet at each month. And then we also, um, part of the community building is individuals. So people who will vol volunteer through the Rotary. Um, Rebecca has been a great addition. She's a wonderful volunteer, by the way. Um, uh, so people that can volunteer or come to our events. So we do have uh, our last year at our action forum for youth, I think there were two uh, city council members from, Man from Sammamish who attended. Um, and so uh, there's opportunities for individuals to work on our committee. So our positive community norms campaign um, is community members that are helping us to determine what's the best messaging that we can do and what's the best way of doing that. Um, and they share out our information as well. So PTAs, we've been, uh, we have our newest uh, member of our team is very involved in the Issaquah School District Council PTA. And so we're really able to then reach in with parents at the PTSA level, which is great. Um, and then we have individuals that are donating to us. So not only does, Cassandra does a ton of work around grant writing, um, but she also has um, those relationships with individuals and, um, and partners around don donation. <laughs> yeah, and the final thing, so what's next for Influence of Choice? Uh, after 10 years under a grant, when things are assured, what, what's next for us? Um, our grant ended a week and a half ago. Um, but we are now a self-sustaining organization and through especially the hard work of Cassandra going out and finding us grants. Um, we have funding. I know we have funding at least through October, uh, um, December of next year. So I have plenty of, of funding for another year. A year ahead. Yes. We're <laughs> trying, yeah. I'd like to be two years ahead. Yeah, that's what we're working towards. Um, and we will continue our main focus on prevention work. There was some discussion, do we want to expand into mental health? But nobody's really doing the work of prevention. And we felt like if we got sidetracked from that, then who would really be focused in on it? And in reality, we support mental health in every single thing that we do and build connections with kids and for kids. And you know, if you have decent mental health, you can make healthy choices. All of it kind of works to build those protective factors for kids. So it's not that we're mocking it's that nobody else is doing the prevention work and it's through prevention. And so we primarily work with students who live in the uh, Issaquah School District, uh, but we do have opportunities to do some work in the city um, partially served by, uh, that we served previously with our DFC grant. So um, uh, recently I emailed all the superintendents in the area and, um, to ask them to send out a letter to staff that will be proctoring the healthy youth survey to explain to students why it's important, why it's important to be truthful, how the data is used, that it's completely anonymous. So it's building those, we are building relationships outside the Issaquah School District, but it is our primary area of focus, um, partly through an MOU that we have with them. And then that, um, our kids wanna say thank you. Now the really interesting part. <laughs> so now we're uh, available for questions you might have. I have one. <laughs> so I look at your brochure here on being able to talk to your child about drugs. My question is, what do you tell parents who get that dreaded question? Didn't you smoke dope when you were in high school? Didn't you drink? Why is it wrong for me to do it when you did it? What do you tell them? So <laughs> I would say that, that would be the number one thing. Um, uh, and it really is. So during our presentations, when we're, we're in front of parents, um, 
the three pieces that it's that's the, the middle piece of things that we've learned things we didn't know um, before about how the earlier you start with alcohol the more likely you'll have a problem with it so um, yes that parent may not have had an ongoing problem or maybe they do and don't know it and so by the student saying hey you used to do these things um, the other thing around especially around cannabis is that it is not the same and tobacco kids think that smoking a vaping cartridge is the same as smoking a cigarette it is the same as smoking a pack of cigarettes so they don't know the intensity of what they're using so some of what we do is educate parents because parents don't have anything to combat that question with you know they don't know that yes when you smoked weed and you wrapped it up in your joint that had three percent thc in it well now it's genetically modified and so it actually has 16 percent thc in what's grown and then if they're vaping it that's 80 to 90 percent thc as they're vaping it and that goes straight from their mouth into their lungs which is the fastest way to get it into their bloodstream and so it's by that's the there's so much education that we need to do with parents that it's not your grandparents, you know, it's not your father's Oldsmobile, it's not your father's weed. And um, so to really kind of give that educational piece to parents is really critical. Um, and the same with tobacco. You would be, we really got back from the Screenagers um, movie that we watched was just how the industry continues to target youth with smoking. And even though they're vaping now, just how Jules actually went to a researcher from Stanford that had had basically the largest amount of like advertising. It was a marketing professor that had all this advertising from the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s related to smoking. And that they're using the same, basically the Jules, Jules took that to use its marketing and said, well, this is how we're going to market now. And so it's very similar and it is really geared towards you. And they sell edibles that look like pretty little gummies that anybody would eat mm -hmm. and be taught little tip of on the floor. Yeah. And that kind of thing. So it's a great question and it's part of our presentation is why. And up, upcoming, we have one with um, Imagine Housing. So down at the, um, the Johnson, uh, Johnson Hill complex, we'll be doing a, basically we'll have parents and kids were doing a community dinner, teen, younger kids, toddlers, and how are we gonna communicate to all of them a prevention mes message? Knowing that I'm gonna be speaking with parents who may currently have a substance use issue. And so how do I have a conversation with my student, especially geared when they can point and say, well, look what you're doing now. And so um, it's, a, it's a hot topic and the best thing is you have to be truthful. Are you seeing much where they're like um, putting fentanyl in the cannabis, the pot, and mixing that type? We've heard about it. So um, especially recently, Bellevue had some incidents where two middle schoolers were poisoned. Fortunately, they didn't die, um, but were poisoned and said it came through vaping. But then we've got another material that says that's just not possible. So we're not quite sure. Uh, we do know that it's they're mixing it in cocaine which apparently is on the rise, um, uh, especially in pills where they're just creating fake pills. They're selling it as a Percocet or an Adderall, and it's not, it's just straight fentanyl. So your kid thinks they're taking somebody's ADHD medicine. Well, yeah. what's the pill? You're probably seeing this with pills. Yeah. Fake pills actually led to more screening of a timely defending plan. They think they're taking an Adderall and it's just, yeah. they, they're not trying to go out and kill themselves by taking it. Don't yeah, but as far as um, I have heard, I don't, I just, I don't think we've experienced in our school district, wherein if they're actually smoking leaf, yeah. that, that it can be tainted with fentanyl. But I don't know that it's necessarily happening in King County, but I have heard of that happen in other places. That's what I, I, I've heard stories about it, but I haven't seen any metrics on it. So. Same here. perfectly safe well once they Don't get to a certain yeah. 
once it once somebody gets to a certain point they are actually asking for fentanyl because you know her heroin or opioids you become uh in kind of immune to the effect you need more to get to sustain um so ultimately it does get to the point where they just ask um, so when we talk about the small amount of fentanyl that's required for somebody who doesn't use to experience an, an, um, a poisoning, a, a fatal poisoning, um, is based on the fact that they are not users. But if they are users of opioids, it does take more fentanyl to reach that point. But, And we do also talk about how Narcan is now available. There's a statewide prescription. You can go to any pharmacy and, and ask for um, Narcan and you'll find I think it's public health. I think it's public health Seattle King County's website. And you can go to that link. This child is engaging and have complete trust in them. I mean, I never thought my kids would do anything. And so far, I'm still trying to figure out what they did that I never knew about. But they might bring a friend home. Mm -hmm. They might bring a friend home who is struggling with a substance. And just to have the ability to take it away. And I have one in my car because I don't know if I'm driving somewhere and run into somebody that. Question: Would you recommend that everyone just have some mm -hmm. on them when they come? Yes, I would. I would, and they last for about two years. It's a nasal inhaler. Really easy to apply. It is no. It's not in the. Well, mm -hmm. this is the one that they're putting out publicly okay. and widely, and yeah. and it might take two doses, which is why every order comes with two doses in it because uh, are addicted. It's taking it hard to revive them. Mm -hmm. You can use it. You can look up a video online. We actually have, I come in sometimes with people coming in and walk all of our teens through it so that they would know what to do. Um, and then you would talk to a parent that you work with with them to have a free dose of some of the treatments that they make for kids if they wanted to take it. I know a parent from Well, I was um, thinking that if the, it, when you're mostly doing prevention work, it's, it's very hard to have data that shows that you're perfect, you're successfully doing something so that something doesn't happen. So it's hard to find data. <laughs> but it seems like from your survey from of several years that that is the data that, that is showing some of that work, right? Correct. So I'm I'm just very impressed with that because as I know it's a hard thing to do, and you seem to be successful going to this point. And that's why our passion is just to be able to keep doing what we're doing because we see that it works, and we use uh, really evidence-based programs and um, want to want to see our kids continue to be healthy. to help us um, professional development, to keep on the top of cutting edge practices, to make sure we have active things to do, to make sure we know, you know, how to get Narcan on time. There's so much that helps us develop as leaders to keep the organization going. And again, we believe we're gonna see substance use has gone up since kids have gone back to work and kids are back in school. And to know this work is not done. We're not doing it. Not thinking any of it. Well, I, I think prevention at a younger age, if you look at the statistics, you're following them throughout the years. So if you prevent it at this level, it's not going to be up here. By the time they get in 12th grade, it's going to be a gradual. And that kind of to go to younger grades or all over the place. And in fact, during the action forum for youth, we had a, a basically a time where you could speak to people at your table and talk about what your um, what ideas you might have, problems you see in the community and what would we need to do. And it, one of the things was around, can we get this into fourth, fifth grade? Kids are learning about these things. 
so much sooner. So how do you tell them, give them a prevention mes message much earlier? And we notice that when we do things like the salmon days, we have a, you know, we'll have a, a booth out there and so that we're interacting with the community and people with young children go, oh, I don't need that. Oh, I don't need that yet. My kids are still little. And I tell them, you know, my daughter was four years old. We were sitting at the dinner, dining room table and my husband and I had each had a glass of wine and she's like, I want some of that. And I'm like, no, baby, it's against the law. Right. That's all the conversation had to be at four. That's all she needed to know. Of course, her answer was, I want against the law. No, <laughs> no, you don't. Um, but but how to have those conversations, it does. It, you starts early. Let yeah, them know. Right. She has to face her own fears. And she's 20 and she knows even now it's against the law. Well, one of the problems I've seen, at least on social media, is that there's an extreme reluctance by the parents to acknowledge a drug problem within our city um, that uh, even just talking about uh, I, I had a I, I was talking with some pe a family and asked you know hey do you know where to get drugs in the city and like, no no we don't know and their kids knew their kids actually knew uh, the exact play apartment complex to do it what can we do to to help parents recognize that yes you know we're an affluent uh, city, but you can't just ignore it because it's uncomfortable. Do we have like a program for that? That's um, much of like, like our hidden in plain sight. When we try to do these parent events, we um, are doing them. That's usually the draw, like come find out what, what a teen bedroom might look like. What can you where find? Yeah, that. can you find where they're hiding things? So that seems to do that. Uh, we're also looking at, um, we'd like to do a screening within, the, within our community for the screenagers, so what Bellevue just did, to be able to have that conversation. Um, and so I just, it's, it's something that we're trying to increase awareness of parents about how to deal with that. And I, it will be interesting to see this healthy youth survey data because it came out very, very low. I think it was less than 1% of students said that they were misusing prescription drugs. I don't believe that based on what I hear. So one of the things as we're, we're developing our strategic action plan for next year, one of the things we'd like to do is some, uh, some youth um, uh, listening sessions with youth that um, are willing to tell us what they know. So the thing about our, our tech kids are great, but they're the group that's not using. Yeah. I need to know what's really going on, who's, you know, at least the ones that are going to the parties, even if they aren't using, but to be able to ask them, where are you getting it? Because most students, it's this round circle. I get it from a friend. Well, great, where does your friend get it? Well, they get it from a friend. I, I need to figure out how are young people getting substances that are illegal for them to obtain, obtaining it. And you still don't know that answer really well. Well, and there's a little bit more than that. Um, just Adderall, you know? I get it from my friend. It's not like it's, that's not opium, you know? It's just Adderall to help me focus. I mean, come on. So it's somebody else's prescription that you're taking and in their mind, they don't see it as an abuse. And my son graduated East Lake back in 2000 and he and I chatted several times and he goes, you know, parents would be amazed at the heroin, that the cocaine and the hard drugs that are in that school. And they wouldn't believe their children are using it. And it's there. I mean, it may not be intentional, but we, we lost those two children here uh, to fentanyl. And it wasn't that they were taking fentanyl they were taking something for their pain that wasn't prescribed to them and it was laced and it killed them. On a prescription bottle, I still can guarantee you, Paige, that that's what's inside. It might be a sleep pill and your son might not even know that there's fake pills in here because he hasn't been around. But a lot of them don't see that as abusing drugs. Right. I just, you know, it's kind of like, taking an aspirin in school. Somebody had it and I took it. Right. And um, 
again, as we as we move forward with our action plan for the upcoming year, another thing that really came out in our action forum for youth was students saying, well, I've been told not to use, but I don't know why. And that's really our aha moment was like, well, then we need to work with the school district and figure out what is the curriculum that you're using, which actually could lead us down a road where we need to work with King County because King County provides, King County Public Health provides the um, the sex ed, the family, family life and sexual health uh, curriculum. So are they the ones supplying the curriculum around substance uh, use prevention and substances with kids in the health class? And we don't know the answer to that. So uh, that's some of the work that we wanna do with the district and whatever we do come up with is something that we can then go to other school districts and say, by the way, we've developed um, this or we've done an analysis and here's some key things that we've found um, are lacking in a lot of, you know, in primarily in health curriculum. So to being able to find those weaknesses. And that goes to something that we've never as an organization done before. And so it's kind of not changing necessarily policy, but it's changing the curriculum, changing the learning that students are doing uh, through the school system, because that's where they learn most of it. I would request it to do a curriculum review of health class, um, school board director Mr. Swan. That's a really good thing for somebody to ask. Um, I don't know if it's somebody in the general public would think to ask that with a focus on, well, where is the prevention piece? But we're looking forward to vetting the information and where are you teaching health? You know, everybody has to have a semester that they graduated from high school, but it also carries over to middle school. So what is being learned there? What about elementary? Is there anything <coughs> happening with that? I don't know yet. Are we meeting at all the scouting groups or selects groups that are outside of schools? Um, the the Kiwanis and Rotary Clubs, their youth programs, is it interact? interact? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then Kids the Kids Kids Kids. Club, yes. Um, that's been a really great resource. We haven't gotten into we would presentation yeah. yet. That would be a good place. We would love to be able to have the opportunity to. Sometimes parents are stupid, you know, and kids don't listen. And sometimes the scoutmasters or the, the the coaches can reach them. I was a Cub Scout gun leader for 15 years, and I had many parents say, can you just talk to my kid about this issue yes. we're having? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As long as it's not the parent, I'm sure you can. Yeah. So in that book for us would just be a, an opportunity being asked to participate and then a bandwidth um, issue. So we have four employees right now, all of us are part-time at some level. Speaking of uh, school curriculum, it reminds me of D.A.R.E. That, and back in the day. Do they still do that? And it, do they don't? When did they stop? And, and The bandwidth wasn't affected. It didn't, oh, yeah. it didn't change. Really? Yeah, so that's why we really focus on the positive, the positive community norms and saying this is what, you know, this is what the, what, where it's at, right? So this is what most kids are doing. So by promoting the positive of, hey, most kids aren't drinking, most kids aren't using um, uh, cannabis, most students aren't vaping and kids experiencing themselves going, I can't use the bathroom because all those kids that are vaping um, I don't want to be a part of that. So trying to come from a positive standpoint. The other piece is that um, kids could sit back and go, well, great, you're telling me about D.A.R.E. and, um, you know, the, the risk of drunk driving and, and death. And, you know, they set up the big, because that, my, my, my son graduated from Liberty in 2017. So it's been a minute. Um, but yes, he recalls them having the, the car out there and the, and, but they'll sit back and go, but. I don't know any of my friends or I've never lost somebody to a drunk driving. So then it does, doesn't become real. And so they don't see the risk because they haven't, you know, kids, it, it didn't happen to them. It didn't happen. Another thing about the community discussion about reaching adults with the messaging and, and, and if they get in front of more parents and explain the laws that already exist in the city of Sonoma and your ordinances uh, against social posting 
and then start messaging what the consequences are because you don't think you realize when you had all the kids to your house for homecoming and then supplied them with the beer and the wine and then went out to dinner, you didn't know what was happening. And that's, those stories are common. Um, find messaging to the parents. Here are the liabilities. Mm-hmm. Here's what's going to happen to your homeowner's insurance when something happens on your property. Here's legally what you can be liable for. But we also need to work with the police department to see how are they enforcing the laws that you already have in place. All right. Yeah. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, quick question. Um, I know you um, spoke to this in your presentation, Moni. Um, you have an MOU with the Esquire School District. And I think um, if you could just t- talk a little bit more, because clearly that's only half um, our school, you know, but, you know, we have Lake Washington and the other half. Um, so would there be any chance of you expanding into Lake Washington? Um, because, you know, we do have two school districts here. I'd say the, the partnership that we have with the Issaquah School District doesn't preclude us from doing things in other districts, which we are actually, we're in the midst of refining that. So in the past, it was never documented, but it was a, you know, with the old superintendent, it was an understanding that we served students similar to the Issaquah Schools Foundation and the Issaquah PTSA Council, that their existence was solely for the benefit of Issaquah School District students. I've been able to negotiate where we're looking at our primary purpose is to serve students within the Issaquah School District to provide some opportunities for us to do some work, but that the primary work. Um, It's a great MOU. They're likely going to be providing us office space. Um, With that MOU, we get access to their buildings um, on like in the week on the evenings. Uh, we would be able to access their building for free for meetings. And if we did something on a Saturday, we only have to pay janitorial costs. So we have, there's, there's many uh, in-kind benefits for us with that MOU that if we decided to increase our service area to include the Lake Washington School District, we would then lose that benefit. The biggest one actually for us is that in the Issaquah E-News when it goes out and talks about an event, Right now, it would be in in what's called Peach Jar, which is kind of their virtual community board. And you have to click on the email and then click on the Peach Jar link and then look through all of the brochures to find what's going on. But with this MOU, we're actually one of the news items in the link. And it makes a big difference as to how many people have visibility to our events. I'm just going to give a little, I love Lake Washington School District. I served on their board because I like Lake Washington School District. I'm still a PTA member. This is my junior year. Uh, And I will say that there are ways. PTA brought us in in Lake Washington for that hidden in plain sight event that was done for them. Um, We had been asked to do, like, Maple Valley had us come out and do an in-person hidden in plain sight. There are some things that we can help with to bring more of the city of Sammamish together in the prevention messaging, and anything that goes up in the city of Sammamish will be visible to Lake Washington. We can also, I, I will personally email every principal and tell them what your substance use rates are at your school because that's public data. So I will say that yes, right now our MOU is with Issaquah. In the past, we have done more with Lake Washington coming out of COVID. They they were not strictly responding. I don't want to say terrible things about any school district because everybody's really trying hard to help. Well, and that's the importance of the partnership with the city is that by interacting with you, even though our primary focus, like if we do a hidden in plain sight at Skyline, it's not only for Skyline or only for Issaquah. I'm not asking them what what school district they're with. So if we do an event that's up in this area for the city, then certainly anybody from the city can come. I may not be doing a curriculum review in the Lake, Lake Washington School District, but you can be certain when I'm done 
I'm going to let Superintendent Holman know, by the way, we did this and here's some of the results. So that's how we are still able to do our work beyond our, our boundaries of the Issaquah School District is whatever we're doing, if there's not a huge cost incursion and I have another way of funding it, then, then we'll be able to do that. I just wanted clarity because I feel like when it comes to applications, it will be a question that the commissioners will want to get clarity on. Are there other questions? Well, thank you very much. This was this really helped because I know we reviewed your uh, uh, package, but this really I think put a lot of things in perspective about understanding, you know, especially the proactive aspect. Like you said, I don't know that it's being addressed by uh, a lot of organizations. We well, appreciate your time. Time you in and you spread the spread the good work and. Influencerchoice.org is on Facebook and Insta. We would love for you to follow what we're doing and get a better idea. And if you have any additional questions, so I will try to get the material, um, the action form for you presentation to Rita to send out to you so that you can see some of the other data. And then what uh, Cassandra passed around, I also have that file that I can uh, make sure that you get. And I did email Rita the invitation to Oh, great. Yeah. And like I said, I'm not going to ask which school those students are from. <laughs> so if they're from Inglewood and they want to come, they're more than welcome to. That's the one I said. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I was actually going to ask you. Yes, I'm like, I don't know. Yeah. Thank you, Philip. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Cassandra, is yes. Mark Stewart any help to you? I just declined a comment. Mm -hmm. okay. And um, our interact is at uh, yes. And actually, Eastlake has um, the DEA came into Eastlake last year, and I think also some other other at Issaquah, and did some information on One Clifton Hill. And that is, you know, strictly the fentanyl and the poisoning, and the next big one that's coming, xylazine. Thank, thank you very much. It's scary that just how much there is, you know, that's out there. Different than when we were kids. You oh, know. yeah, it is. Yeah. It is so surprising when it comes to this. There's so much mentality and has to be shared. No idea. I didn't even know that. What, what's the new one she said? Silence? Silence? No. I, I don't know either. Yeah, I think a lot of it is just, you know, educating the parents in our town about the drug stuff. Like that, like I said, I've just seen a lot of parents like very, no, 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 no problem, no problem. Mm -hmm. I remember the, the pot, but they had like bitch weed, you know, which was like. Yeah, <laughs> yeah not very powerful. <laughs> you had to be pretty desperate. But alcohol is more addictive because yeah. it's so hard. Yep. A lot of it is just understanding, especially with the pot being legal, as, as far as serious, it's like, mm -hmm. you know, if people are doing it, parents are doing it at home, how much risk is that for your kids? And here's the thing. Benefits are slowly absent, and then they have another one. Yeah, it can be. Yeah. Wait for Rita. I think you wanted to talk about sort of November. So there's some tidbits and training schedule. Yeah. yeah. Right. I know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
Peter, we were just talking about what, what the, the plans for November. Yeah, no, thank you for bringing that up. So um, we um, are scheduled for the second Wednesday of November, um, and that would be the 8th. Um, Council, City Council are actually going to have their meeting on the 8th. They have elections on the 7th, I believe. And so they have bumped out their council meeting a day. So it will be on the same day as ours. Um, and the protocol is, is that we wouldn't have like two like open meetings at the same time. So, you know, City Council like, you know, trumps us. So um, we'd have to change our date. Um, so there's a number of things that we can do, either we look for an alternative date, or if the commission um, decides, they can also decide that the uh, virtual training they're having on the 13th can kind of um, be their November meeting. Um, so it's up to you, to the commission. And that's the will of the commission. My thought is, uh, you know, we could just use the, the November training. To see, you know, that's a good opportunity for us to learn some more. About What's the November training? I mean, it's the virtual training about citizen advisory meetings and just really just to um, um, how you run. Hmm. Sorry, I'm looking at that person. I'm looking at uh, um, how you run a fair a fair meeting. Uh, Mike, do you have any more details on that? Let me just quickly look at my it's notes. Not the dinosaur training. Uh, no, no, no. So it's Anne McFarlane that will be doing it, but it will be a different type of meeting. Um, it won't be the Jurassic Parliament, um, and other commissions will be there. And it's really just to learn tips and tools and how to run effective meetings and follow best best practices for fair and inclusive meeting discussions. Um, and it's from six to eight. It's over Zoom. Yes. Nothing is mandatory. It is, yeah. however, highly encouraged. <laughs> so, so is there uh, an uh, interest? Do, do we want to uh, reschedule the meeting for uh, November uh, to a different uh, date, or is it discussion? I think. That's a great question. So I'm in the process of trying to like connect with folks um, and uh, schedule that. So yeah. They could also could they also be done in December if there anything that would be that would yeah. be an option to produce in December. This is September right now, right? Is already October. Damn, it sucks being retired. We have pump, <laughs> we have pumpkins there, Stan. It's, it's <laughs> hey, every day is Saturday, okay? I'm retired. <laughs> so do, do we have a, like, uh, a request uh, to just uh, re, uh, re uh, let's see, change the date, uh, or would we like to uh, move the drug uh, substance abuse to December? I would say, and it's open to discussion. Do you, I don't need to make a motion, do I? Oh, so let's do the training in November as our meeting. Yeah. And then it gives Rita a little more time to line up the substance abuse people in December. I already put, I planted a couple bugs, so hopefully they'll come back around. All right. That's my opinion. Sounds good to me. Yes. Yes. So it sounds like uh, we've got a quorum that uh, for November we'll just use the parliamentary meeting as our uh, December or uh, November uh, meeting, and then we'll. Uh, do discussion on substance abuse in December. Good. Uh, any any other issues? Yes. Yes. 
Um, so a December meeting, are we going to be looking at our calendar for next year? Because we kind of run out in December, don't we? Um, I think traditionally we've always like, um, like kind of populated the calendar at the beginning of the year um, and then brought that to the commission. Um, yeah, I think that's what we've traditionally done, right? Yeah, typically that's what so we've done. So if in December, if we have any suggestions on topics that we'd like to bring up in January for our calendar, sure. would that be appropriate? Um, so just bear in mind, Commissioner Gunno, that we're going to have the application. So I just have to populate um, the calendar with the application end dates and reviews, etc. cetera. Um, so, and that will take... I think traditionally it's been like from February, March, all the way through to September, but absolutely we're always open to any input that you might want um, for the calendar. I love being overworked, so. <laughs> you know, Commissioner Bottenberg, I don't know, actually, Mike, I really want to, let's go back to Sahali, but, you know, that's just me. <laughs> no. Um, We have a motion to adjourn. I second. All in favor? Aye. <laughs> Double for Stan. <laughs>